Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Michael Giannis. This is Neighborhood Watch, where we watch every episode of, of Sesame Street, chronicling our journey, our thoughts, our feelings. It's very important for, you know, a historical document, I think. That's kind of what I'm aiming for at this point. Um, today I'm joined by a new guest. Today I have Emily here with me. How are you doing, Emily? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing amazing, because I just watched another hour of Sesame Street. There's nothing better to do. I <laughs> doesn't get better. Than that. I like to rewatch episodes in my free time to make sure I got everything down. I'm watching that as soon as we end this. Yeah. Watch again. So this was episode 1,257. Uh, this was called what was the name of it? It was called Telly Monster Moves In. Um, this episode seemed to introduce a couple like new new names, which you know uh, they haven't lasted as long. Because, you know, there are classics like Oscar and Elmo, right. which you know. Mm-hmm. What is your experience with Sesame Street, by the way? Like, did you watch a bunch as a kid? Um, I did when I was really young. Apparently, my first birthday party was Elmo-themed. Nice. I don't, like, remember watching it, but apparently I was obsessed with Elmo. I had a bunch of Tickle Me Elmo stuffed animals and pajamas and all that stuff. So when I was really little, I was really into it. Awesome. The perfect background. Right, except so... I don't remember <laughs> That's the point of Sesame Street. It just kind of, it, it gives you a foundation, you know? It guides you, and it just lets you be. <laughs> it is my guiding light through these trying times. Um, so, uh, this, uh, yeah, 1257, uh, Telly Monster moves in. Um, the good thing about doing this, like, where we have big gaps between the episodes is we get a new introduction every time. Um, mm-hmm. So this, this one, uh, 1979 was when it, when it aired. Um, the first thing that we noticed about this introduction, um, <laughs> some sort of theme of overinflated kids. <laughs> that looked really confused. They just looked really lost. The, their literal clothes seemed to be filled with air. Right. <laughs> it, it just looked like somebody plugged a pump in and just like went for it. <laughs> so that was a good start. Uh, I enjoyed this this opening a lot more than any of the others. I had a great time with the opening. <laughs> <laughs> and we start... A lot of the episodes seem to start with Big Bird. This one was no different. Uh, this is our first glimpse of Big Bird in a literal nest. You know, I I can honestly say I did not know Big Bird had a nest. Neither did I. So, so on the last episode, we, we got a glimpse in, inside Big Bird's home, which they called a nest, but it, it was just a room filled with, like, weird junk. Like Sesame uh-huh. Street junk, but this time it was like a literal made of twigs and stuff nest. It was interesting. I felt as like a big bird that kind of defeated the whole living in a nest thing. <laughs> I think it's not. You think you just have an apartment? I know, you know a loft. <laughs> why doesn't he have the nest he had last time? I don't understand why. <laughs> was the was the last episode previous to this one or? That was about a hundred episodes ago, give or take. Okay. Well, then, why did it go backwards? Why did he, like, have a place to live, and then he kind of resorted back to twigs? So you're saying that you think that Big Bird should be evolving, should be getting right. more competent as a right. Right, like, more modern. Yeah. I don't understand why he would go from, like, a nice place to live, you know, like, a, a house, and then go straight to twigs and branches. I feel like that wouldn't be preferable. You know, a possibility is that, because what, what Big Bird talks about is he's remembering back to when he was a baby and his mother was feeding him. Maybe this is like a nostalgia trip for him. That's true. Um, Only the the next episodes will tell if he's, like, back in the nest. <laughs> um, that, another interesting thing about this Big Bird thing is that he describes, like, the way that a normal bird would cry out for food. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're led to believe that he started out as a normal bird. With with like a mother bird that, that that like just peeps and like doesn't talk because Big Bird's talking. Big Bird is a talking bird. But... Yeah. Does that suggest he's like a mutant type of bird because not he's enormous too? Like his name literally has the adjective of what he is <laughs> in it. So like, is... since he talks about being a normal bird at one point, does that mean that he he's not a normal bird anymore? Right. And it would be a very specific kind of mutant as well, not like a like a genes from birth, it would be like you were exposed to radiation superhero style. Made you like have human legs and uh, understand English. 
<laughs> yeah. Very loose grasp, but, but <laughs> still. Specific. Is Big is Big his like genus? The biggest <laughs> birdus um I don't know. <laughs> it's the bird phylum. Alright. Um after that we had the Ernie and Bert present skit. Um I've taken to calling them Ernie and Bert, by the way. I know their canonical name is Bird and Ernie. But we've decided along the course of these episodes that Ernie doesn't get enough respect in this relationship. Obviously. So we're putting him up front. I like it. Yeah. Um, Ernie Ernie sees this present, and he he assumes it's for him, as 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 Ernie would do. Good old Ernie. Um, he assumes what's inside of it is like a football because he likes football and all that sort of thing. And but of course, what was inside was a nice frilly hat. <laughs> For Aunt Matilda. Yeah. Or he doesn't pick up on that, though. He thinks it's for him still. He looks good with it on. Like, I'm not going to say no. Yeah. Like if I I'm, think it was... Go ahead. If I'm Bert, I'm saying I'm I'm changing it up. I'm just going to go buy another hat because seeing Ernie with that hat on was very, very pleasurable. Should have should have changed his thought process. <laughs> I think it was a, a little forward of Ernie to just rip open the box, though. I mean... <laughs> was never told that that was for him. I mean, Bert could have been a little more upfront with that. When Ernie kept guessing, he should have said, it's not for you, but I, th- I thought that was a little forward of Ernie to just rip into it anyway. You know, that's a good point, because, I mean, Ernie's nothing if not forward. But Bert, like, you'd think by this time, Bert would have figured out that he needs to be crystal clear with Ernie. Right, yes. It's like, like I said, um, Bert reminds me of Squidward, so... If I can compare this to Spongebob, it's like Squidward has to be extremely upfront with Spongebob or he does not get it. Like, he has to scream at him to get out of his house in order for him <laughs> to do it. It's it's a similar thing. You need to make sure Ernie understands what you're telling him, and he obviously didn't. I, I like the, the Bert as a proto-Squidward kind of idea. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> He's the nose and everything. <laughs> the nose, the voice, they're all they're The all attitude. Spot on. Yeah. I'm sure Bert plays clarinet. It seems Badly. like that kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> after that, we had um, a, a song. This was it was called like "Size of It." It was a catchy was, song. Yeah, that was it was interesting. I didn't expect that to be about sizes or anything. It didn't feel like that was going to be the theme of the episode, but or the the song. Yeah, there was a lot of this episode in particular had a lot of kind of non sequitur songs. Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I was getting at. I just didn't really expect any of the songs to yeah. be what they were about because it was kind of just random. Yeah, a lot more in the past uh, they would they would stick to the theme a little better. But I kind of like this sort of scatter shot. You know, you've got the theme ones, but then you've also got these out of nowhere little bits. Yeah, more to learn. Yeah, plus the production on this one was very good. Like this sort of like zooming out to see the scale of everything. Yeah. Was, the little rocket. Yeah. Was that the one with the little rocket flying around the moon? Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. Then, oh, then we had a classic, uh, a classic skit, the Count song. Okay, I, I am so glad that this is the episode I did because a long time ago I found this YouTube video of that song where everybody, uh, they bleeped out every single time he said Count, so he was like. Oh, what's one of the... Oh, so, like, he'd be like, you know that I'm called the Count because I really love to, and then it'd beep out. (laughs) It's the the funniest video for any of you people listening. Look up the Count Censored. It is the funniest video you'll ever see. So, like, when that... When he walked out, I was like, oh, my God, I get to be in the episode with this. It's really excited. (laughs) I'm glad they found a way to repurpose this for the modern audience. (laughs) Because the song is very good, too. Yes, yes. I just song. I couldn't stop thinking about that version. I couldn't even focus. <laughs> uh, I was like cracking up. <laughs> Let's see. After that, we had um, another one of those uh, Sesame Street classic montages of just uh, like sort of B-roll footage of different things as little kids describe what it is. Uh, oh, was that the eagle? That was the bald eagle on the highways. Yeah, that was that was that felt like felt like there's no point to that at yeah. all. I did not enjoy that. I thought. Um, uh, the, like, I, I usually like this sort of, like, out of nowhere, just sort of, here's a mundane thing that we're going to entertain you with for, like, a couple, couple minutes. Yeah. But this one, for some reason, it was just, it, it, it didn't go anywhere for me. 
it yeah it never reached a purpose like i understand the purpose of it was to pass time but you need to pass time with something that has a purpose to it other than that and it just was like the bald eagle sees roads and then that was pretty much it yeah <laughs> just described roads <laughs> Uh, but then we move on to a to a very important scene, I think, because this is a scene that can only happen once. Um, it's Cookie Monster. He's with a telephone, and yes. he's describing to us what a telephone is and why it's good. And there's no, and it's just he's doing a very good job of it, which is not Cookie Monster's thing. Cookie Monster right. is usually the punchline to someone else's skit. Yes. But uh, what happens in this scene is two. Two just regular people come in, two of the adults. I think it was um, Gordon Jr. and the other woman. That's what I'm I think her name was Maria or something. Maria, yeah. We figured that out a while ago, yeah. Um, So they come in, and they they pick up the phone and say, Well, Cookie Monster, what good is this for? And Cookie Monster explains to them, Well, you can call anyone in the world if they have a phone. Uh, (laughs) David, which is his real name, not Gordon Jr. Uh, (laughs) David, David takes takes the phone, and then takes a bite out of it. <laughs> Much to the dismay of Cookie Monster. <laughs> Cookie Monster is flabbergasted. <laughs> he, he cannot believe what he's seeing because David passes along the phone to Maria, and she does the same thing. She takes a bite out of it. And they're very aggressive about it, too. It's not like a little bite. They literally go like, wow! <laughs> this is why I think it's an important scene, is because you can only pull the, the role reversal once. Like, that's a very specific punchline mm-hmm. of, you know, C- Cookie Monster's thing. You When he comes into a scene, whenever someone says his name and he comes on to frame, you know how the scene is going to end. Right. And the other weird thing is that he would usually be the one eating things in the scene, but he was, like, watching other people ruin the scene w- by eating, which is normally what his problem is. Yep. So this is a landmark scene in Sesame Street canon because there's, there's pre- Role reversal and post because you they've they've used it up they've burned it March sixth nineteen seventy nine they used that joke so I'm gonna keep them honest as we go on if they pull it again I'm gonna call them on it (laughs) you like write a complaint you're like I want to talk about something you did in the (laughs) seventies you you are create you are creatively bankrupt sir (laughs) Jim Henson make an original thought (laughs) you have contributed nothing you're a sellout all right um. After that, we had, oh, the crow and the water scene. That was interesting. That brought, like, some science in. Yeah, some sort of, like, spatial reasoning kind right. of thing. Um, but, but I think the, the standout thing was an observation that we both made independently of each other. Um, that the, the narrator of this scene sounds almost precisely like Rod Serling. That was so scary. I didn't notice until you said it, and then I started to reflect on it more, and I was like, oh my god. Like, I, all I could hear, like, every time he took a pause, I was just waiting for the punchline of, in the Twilight Zone. Yeah. <laughs> it sounded like it was going there, and I wouldn't have been, like, opposed to that. That would have been a really cool twist. Yeah. It had the same rhythm and everything. Uh, after that, we had uh, the livestock auction. Which was a good scene, you know, you got to see one of those skilled, like, auctioneers doing their thing. Yeah, honestly, that was my least favorite scene out of the whole episode. Yeah. Just because it bored me. Yeah, I, I don't know. that, yeah. Like, I didn't really care about a guy auctioning off livestock, and I don't really imagine a toddler would either. Yeah. I think another problem, too, was the guy was just boring. Yeah, he had, like, nothing to him. He was just kind of monotone yeah. until he started auctioning. And and for all the for all the like like country themed antics we have later in the episode, this guy was the most like milk toast boring dude I've ever seen. And it was on a farm. Yeah, it should have been. He should have he should have yucked it up a bit. Yeah, he should have been classic farmer for that scene. <laughs> I wanted it to blur the line between Muppet and human. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but overall, not impressed with that scene on my end here. Yeah. But the great thing about Sesame Street, two minutes, you're done. You're out. Next thing. Yeah. And the next thing is Kermit and Grover. Uh, we're going to learn about the number five, which is the number sponsor for this episode. Shout out. Uh, I, <laughs> go, go for it. I thought I liked this scene. I thought this was funny. Even though it was predictable, it still made me laugh. I liked it. 
Yeah, that's. I think that's one of the special skills of Sesame Street is that even when you can predict where the scene is going, like ten seconds into it, if you still enjoy it. I think that's when Sesame Street kind of hits its peak. Yeah, uh, I thought. Ah, uh, go for it. <laughs> uh, Kermit asks Grover to bring bring him five blocks from a big pile of blocks off in the background, but unfortunately Grover uh, can't count to five. He, he can only count to one. <laughs> Which I really think, with his grasp on the English language, I would have thought <laughs> he would be able to get at least a five. At least I a think, five. I think Kermit could have sped that up if he just said, like, bring me one block. Oh, wait, I guess that wouldn't make sense. Let's <laughs> say bring me one block five times, but he doesn't know what that means. So, <laughs> never mind, he couldn't have sped that up. It really brings into perspective, because it's been so long since we've thought about what it's like to learn such basic concepts. Yeah, I think that's why that kind of escaped me, that that didn't yeah. make any sense. Like how do you because... teach number five to someone who can only count to one? Yeah. <laughs> it's like this. I guess that was the way to do it. You're like, <laughs> okay, do it again. Yep. Okay, do it again. Give me one until I say stop. <laughs> it was essentially this scene. You could say, like, get me one, and then again, and again, and again, and again. Yep. And then you got... <laughs> so that was fun. I like Kermit and Grover. They got a good rapport. Uh, after that was pinball number count favorite. What did you Wait, think of this one? one? Which one was that? The pinball animation of the number five. Oh, with that song. Yeah, it's awesome, right? I was familiar with that song, and I don't know how. I've I've <laughs> shared it before. It may have been that. It may have been just it's so culturally important to us as a society. Which yeah, it should be. I had. I had no idea that song was from Sesame Street, but, like, when it started, I knew the tune and I knew how it went and everything. And I was like, how did I know this? Because I feel like I don't – I've never seen this episode before, so. <laughs> but I, I liked that one, too. The song was catchy and obviously sticks. God, it's such a good, funky – it's – oh, man. I love it. It's, it's That's peak animation Sesame Street for me. It's yeah. <laughs> a catchy song, these sort of weird avant-garde visuals. It's great. Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> and then we take a turn to Turtle. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> there was one word spoken during this scene. Turtle. <laughs> that was so weird. It's just walking around. It didn't do anything. We didn't learn anything. I tried I tried my hardest to like figure out like what they're doing. Like they're kind of like looking at each other and looking away. I thought maybe they're trying to tell a story or something. I I only could get from it that they were introducing you to the animal. Yeah. But it was it was so awkward. It was another one of those, like, passing time things that didn't make sense at all. Yeah, for sure. Similar to when they just said bald eagle, <laughs> but at least that one they talked about roads a little bit. Yeah, they switched it up. This was just stock footage of turtles for now. For a <laughs> Not interesting stock footage either. No. Well, that's the like thing our... about turtles is they're the uninteresting animal. I wanted to see some interesting stuff. If you're gonna if you're gonna put that on TV for my entertainment. I want to see something better than turtles just kind of being themselves. <laughs> uh, after that, uh, an animation of a girl and a boy. The girl is trying to guess what surprise the boy has in his hand. Oh, that was weird, too. Yeah, this is another weird one. Not not very thematically interesting. Just sort of, it's not what you you expect, because he's got yeah, an she, elephant in his hand. Yeah, she's like guessing all these things that would fit into the palm of somebody's hand, and he's like, nope, and he keeps checking. To make sure that she's not right. And then, like, when she gives up after, like, two guesses, he, like, lets this elephant out of his hand. And she's not even impressed. Yeah. She's just like, oh, that was my next guess. And you're like, what? She's playing it off all cool. She's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, she had no idea. She's blown away. <laughs> I think an interesting thing about this scene is that a lot of the scenes like this in Sesame Street is, you know, I think another, like, kids show would would stick to some sort of realistic uh, resolution, or at least have some sort yeah. of resolution at all, because I think a lot like of... A yeah. Like, like skits like this, and, and another one we'll see later in which Ernie puts away some toys, they don't have, like, a lesson built into them. Like, you're, you're left to... And, and what I mean by that is, like, you can learn a lesson, but it's left up to the kid to put it together. Yeah, it's really just... I think it's really just there for, like comedic relief from learning sure so you're like oh but what you could get from the comedic relief is that an yeah. elephant can fit in the hand and then boom you've put together sizes which kind of goes back to that song oh yeah oh we may have stumbled upon 
the, the a secret for theme. The oh my god. We're going to have to keep a, a sharp eye out as we discuss these later scenes to see if there's the a big and small. Right there. <laughs> um, after that, Mr. Hooper introduces us to one of the two new named Muppets of the episode. Um, some Possibly the star of the episode. <laughs> the namesake, at least. It, I'm not a very fond of his character, but uh, he, he's, he's the central focus of a series of scenes. Uh, in this one... Um, some sort of weird, like, pinkish red Muppet comes in and says, plug this in, plug this in. And Mr. Hooper's like, oh, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Mr. Hooper's great, by the way. He's a <laughs> continuing character that we all love. Is he? Oh, yeah, he's Good. been in all of them. I did not know that. I liked him. I liked his character. Yeah, he's... He was like that loopy scientist. I, I liked it. Yeah. And he's very, he, he, has, he has trouble sort of grasping onto things. Not like intellectually but like he, he i don't think i think he would prefer it if the muppets did not inhabit sesame street <laughs> it just messes with his brain his, his, his business he's trying to run a business here mr hooper <laughs> is curious enough to go outside to find out who this weird monster is and we find out that it's telly monster and sure enough telly monster spends all his life sitting in front of a television uh, just watching TV. How many other Muppets have Monster in their name? We've got Cookie Monster. Uh, that's it. Yeah, okay. I feel like that was that was somewhat of a ripoff because Cookie Monster came first. Cookie Monster is obviously more important. He gets the the whole monster thing, and then Cookie's thrown in there because that's what his main character is. Right. But Telly Monster to me just seems like a bit of a ripoff, like – Oh, we don't have a name. Let's just call him a monster. And, oh, let's put whatever his main character point is, television. I feel like he's just a ripoff. Yeah, because I think, you know, Cookie Monster's good because he's he was the first. He was the first of the sort of, he has one thing that he does, and that is eat things, specifically cookies, if they're available. So his name makes perfect sense. Right. But now that you get into Telly Monster, you're doing this again with something even more specific as a character. I think... Because, you know, all the other Muppets, they, they're they just characters. You know, Big yeah, Bird just, is, is just a big bird. Kermit is a frog. He doesn't, like, have a specific thing. Grover, Ernie, Bird, I can go on. But, you know, those are those are all the favorites, and they don't have, like, a gimmick. Right, they just got names. Right. So, I, I, I don't know if we'll see Telly Monster again. It seems like it does, because, number one, the name of the episode is Telly Monster Moves In. And then also, like, a lot of the puppets, if they're not important, they don't get names. And it wasn't resolved. Yeah, like, he doesn't, he's not pulled away from the TV, which you would think the, te the television, the kids' television show would, that would be the lesson they're trying to teach. Yeah, but since he doesn't go away, we have reason to believe he's going to come back. Yeah, so I hope we get to see that resolution, or, or at least see him go away, because I don't like him. Right. <laughs> Uh, then we have a quick animation about where N belongs. It's an ant pulling a, a giant letter N. Uh, I don't know. I didn't get much out of that one either. <laughs> I don't think we're meant to. <laughs> well, even even if the lesson was to teach kids where N is in the alphabet, it, it wasn't really like executed that well, in my opinion. Like He's just lost and confused for like a second, and then automatically it's in the right place. And he's like, oh... This is where N goes. <laughs> Wasn't that special? <laughs> yeah, it, that's an interesting thing because, like, previous, in the early episodes of Sesame Street, I feel like they were a lot more deliberate with their animations. They didn't have, like, the budget to spend on this sort of throwaway, not very good animation. Like, if it was an animation, it was going to be good. Yeah. Wasn't just going to waste your time. Yeah. Uh, luckily, after that, we had something really good. We had the Casey McPhee train song. That was by far my favorite song in the whole thing. Yeah, this was a very good... It was it was pretty long. It was like four minutes long, but it was really good. It was Cookie Monster. He's conducting a train uh, that's delivering a bunch of sweets and like candy foods uh, to the kids. I was thoroughly entertained by that. <laughs> I didn't get much of a lesson out of it, but entertainment-wise, it, it was there. Yeah, it was a great idea. Um, the song's great. Cookie Monster has a great solo. Uh, you... I liked the, the use of the banjo. Kind of kept up with the country theme that kept occurring. Yeah. In skits. Plus Cookie Monster in like a conductor's hat. That's pretty good. 
you don't you don't get better than that. And I liked when the uh, the other people in the train were like singing back up and they were kind of just swaying back and forth. Yeah, yeah. That was great. <laughs> um, that scene is resolved. Is there's an a- avalanche and Cookie Monster is stranded with the train that's stuck with all the food. And you think he's gonna eat all the food, but he saves the day. He eats he eats all the snow instead. So what what lesson can we get out of that? I'm sure there is one to be found there. I'm just not figuring it out. I think if we if um, maybe like know your talents, know what you're good at, and apply them in different ways. I, I can see that. Yeah. I like it. Maybe it's just That's... be careful when you're driving trains. Watch out for avalanches. Yeah. Keep the tracks clear. But also another theme of the song was it kept saying that he will like I don't remember if the words exactly were like he will get them out of there but. It was like stressing perseverance. That could be another theme. Yeah, and like I think like you know if you want to get if you want to really dig in and examine this this is like a piece of literature. I like I like that the use of through it kind of sounds like choo choo like a train. Ooh. I enjoyed that. I like that. Yeah. So very good, Sesame Street. Thumbs up. Well done. Well done. <laughs> uh, then we had uh, this was probably my least favorite uh, skit of the whole thing was Nancy the nanny goat. Oh, definitely. Ah, I keep saying like all of them were my least favorite. <laughs> I, I obviously I wasn't really fond of a lot of these skits, yeah. but that one, I I mean I got the purpose was to use words with the letter N as often as possible. That was well executed, but <laughs> there was it was a boring skit, boring animation in my opinion, boring yeah. story. Boring characters. Yeah, it just had that like ugly like late seventies you know ed- educational cartoon look. That's exactly what it looked like. It looked like those videos you used to watch in like elementary school that teach you about counting. Yeah, very that uh, kind of animation. Very sort of knockoff Electric Company sort of look. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, not fond of that. So not going to spend much time on it. Um, but then we went on to probably the, the weirdest. Well, there's a lot of weird ones. Which is <laughs> Was this something. the guy? Like this is the ping pong bar. ball. Oh, oh, okay, that was weirder than the guy. <laughs> um, I didn't know what was going on. Because this one was completely silent, not even any incidental music or, or like, not even, like, a drone. or No sound effects. No sound effects, just complete silence. Silent. It's a hand that, like, no pu- – you'd think, like, they, they were, like, practicing puppets or something <laughs> without the actual puppet on the hand. <laughs> so strange. It's just a hand – on screen, like holding a ping pong ball and squeezing it, and then another. Well, before the before the ping pong ball even showed up, wasn't the hand just kind of like stretching and like? Yeah, just doing, doing like weird like hand gymnastic things. <laughs> like exercising your fingers. It was <laughs> weird. Yeah, they just caught like the puppet warm up on on tape and said, "Let's use this." <laughs> puppet. <laughs> That's exactly what it looked like. Like somebody was getting ready to go. Yeah. Weird. Um. But yeah, he's playing with a ping pong ball, and then another hand comes in. I wonder if it's the same guy. I wonder. Um, they kind of looked similar in size and color. Yeah, it's possible. Um, but uh, maybe maybe that's that's what we're supposed to get out of it, is that it's impressive that someone can play two characters with their hands. I'm not impressed. Yeah, no, because he, <laughs> <laughs> he just switches out the ping pong ball with an egg when the other hand is not looking. And then the other hand squeezes the egg, and it, it gets all over him. Weird. Weird physical gag. And then, and then I, I remember when it started, I was like, what's going on? And you're like, just give it time. And then it ended, and I didn't I didn't get it still. Yeah, no, I thought it was going to, I thought they were going to pull it out. I thought they were, this was going to be like the worthwhile weird one. but It wasn't the worthwhile weird one. It was just weird. Failure to launch. Um, <laughs> then we had a Tele Monster, our, our next bit of scene. Uh, David and Maria are talking about how they're going to uh, go and try and convince Telemonster to go play baseball in the park with them. Which, to their dismay, goes itself. Yeah, it does not happen. Telemonster is only interested in sticking his face at the TV and watching... It's blue, as he says. He doesn't go, and that's where the scene ends. <laughs> It's, it's, it's very we resolved the scene there. <laughs> it's not satisfying these these sort of chain chains of scenes that don't have a resolution. I They're really, not. I really think they need to stick with the one and done technique. 
Unless it's with, like, Kermit or something. I think Kermit can pull it off, but anyone else... Yeah, but we already don't really take to this character so much, and it just keeps, like, going back to some little take with him that doesn't really have an ending, yep. and you're like, oh, great, that means it's coming back. Yeah. Really unfortunate that they've centered the episode around this, but uh, we had the return of another uh, series, which is the He, She, It, where they describe the operation of a simple machine. Uh, this time it was last time it was a it was a faucet. This time it was a vacuum cleaner. I found this one to be interesting. Yeah, this was your first bit, your first glimpse of this one. We've had this this style of scene once before, which I can see I how liked, was popular. I liked how her name was Sheila and her shirt said she. What was his name? Ah, oh, God, I I wish I could remember. It was something close to he. He, he Herbert. I don't know. I, I was thinking it was Herbert, except that doesn't say the he part. Yeah, probably, I don't think kids would be able to put that together. It yeah. was it was weird, whatever it was, but I thought that was clever how they took their names from, like, their pronouns. Yeah. And then I liked when they were both explaining what they thought goes on inside of a vacuum cleaner. I liked the different ideas. Those were creative. I liked it. Yeah, they, they, it's good. And then it saves the day by telling us how it actually works. All thanks to it. Which is also um, productive for kids to be learning that kind of thing, so. <laughs> it had a purpose to it, unlike many of the other skits of this episode. Definitely. There's some meat to this sketch, which is important. Uh, then we had a celebrity appearance. I, c I can only assume it's a celebrity. I have no idea who it is, but it would seem to be a song written by a celebrity, performed by one uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow with a bunch of kids surrounding her on a beach. I liked that song. I thought um, the backup with the kids was actually really cute. Yeah. They, they were, like, harmonizing and everything. Yeah, they were they were skilled singers, unlike in the past when we've had, like, kids trying to clap along, and it's just, <laughs> it's a train wreck. And then the, um, the intro to the whole episode, they were so out of tune. But then during that song, I thought pretty much everyone sounded pretty. It, the song had a nice message and meaning to it. It was like living in today and not worrying about yesterday or tomorrow. Yeah. Good scene. I liked it. Definitely. Um, after that, lots of peaks and valleys with this one, because after this, we went right back down to uh, the, the elephant puzzle scene. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, so if I can illustrate this, it's if you've ever like had one of those little toys with um, like little sliding tiles on it, and you have to like slide them around, and there's like one open piece, and you have to make it a complete picture. That was Board this. Toys. That's all it was. It was like the whole screen was one of those things, one of those toys, and you just slowly watched tiles slide around until it made a picture. And it wasn't like a quick process, like, oh, uh, here's a bunch of tiles. Oh, I see what it is now. It took forever. Right. Every interesting, like... Every way they could have made this interesting by like having like a bunch of pieces or making it an interesting photo, they or making it go really fast. They they screwed up on each one of those because it was slow, boring, and predictable. And they repeated an elephant, which elephants were not the theme of this episode, but they already had an elephant in another sketch. They should have come up with something else. I thought it's just lazy. It is. Um, Ernie and Bert uh, come up again after this. Uh, I like this one a lot. Uh, Bert tells Ernie that he's got too many toys out, and then he needs to put some of them away. Not all of them, just just some of them, most of them. Most of them. Yeah. Um, and then Ernie. Yeah, go ahead. Into, yeah, Ernie decides that it would be easier for him if he separated the toys into groups. That way, he could take certain groups at a time, and uh, confusion ensues from there. <laughs> I. <w> <laughs> I have to wonder how deliberate this was, because I think Ernie <laughs> just wanted to play with his fire truck, because the groups that he decides to put away are the things that are red, the things that have ladders, the things that have wheels. Things uh, that are big. Yes. And, of course, the only thing that it fits into any of those groups is his fire engine. I think maybe that was partially so that he didn't have to do the chore that he told Bert he'd do. Because mm. for Bert, it's probably just easier to just do it himself. Yeah. And so Ernie may know that. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was funny. I liked it. Yeah. I keep saying I liked it after all of them, so. 
this episode's a lot of ups and downs for me, apparently. <laughs> Some of them I was not fond of, but Ernie, Ernie made that funny. Definitely. Then we had uh, N and M words with Marie, Maria. Uh, she she was joined by Barkley halfway through the scene, to my delight. I really like Barkley. I think he's the most like, as as far as just like technicality and skill of making a Muppet. I think Barkley's the best because like it's really hard to tell like what what a person is doing inside that suit. Yeah. Yeah, I had never seen that uh, character before. Yeah. But. I agree. It was. It was. It made it look real. How you couldn't tell there was a hand holding it up or anything. Right. Like with it. it if if you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen Barkley before, imagine like Snuffleupagus, but a little smaller and a lot more animated. Um. I th- yeah. Because because we were introduced to Barkley in the previous episode, and we 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 considered the fact that there may just be a regular dog inside. With its really? with its mannerisms and the way it moves around, it was it was so believable. I really like. Yeah, that. I wouldn't have wanted that thing like jumping up on me though. When it jumped on her, I was like, um, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, this was the final scene. I believe it was the final scene with Telly Monster. Um, she goes. O- Maria goes over to Telly Monster to ask him, "What are some M words you can think of?" Uh, Telly Monster goes on to list off a bunch of television shows of the era. That begin with stars M. and characters. Yep. Which I wasn't really sure why that bothered Maria so much. I'm not sure. I don't know why that bothered her. She asks for M words, and while they maybe all be like television shows, he wasn't wrong. He did what she asked. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's the tragedy of Telly Monster is that he does what everyone wants him to do for the most part. Like he didn't play baseball, but like he didn't want to, and that's his right to say no. Right. Maybe maybe Telly Monster is a sort of Oscar the Grouch story, and we're supposed to pity him. So why was she why was she so put out by him not by him saying words that are like television shows and stars and stuff? Maybe maybe he just she just doesn't like these new people moving into the neighborhood. Well, then she shouldn't have asked him a question. I mean, let's cut him some slack here. He did what she asked. Yeah, and it's not good enough for her. I'm starting to change my opinions of Telly Monster. I'm starting to feel for him rather than to yeah. test him. Yeah, I'm seeing things from his side now. And it's not good. The, these, it's not. These neighbors it's have tragic. not been welcoming. No. You know, the, when when they go and ask him to play baseball, like, what do you think? Like, he hates baseball. He likes television. Like, ask him if to they go... Really, if, if they really want to, like, make friends with him, why don't they watch something with him? Yeah, like, go to a movie. Come on. That would probably be good. It's a way to get him to leave the TV, but still gets what he wants. Yeah. Really, lots of insensitivity coming from the residents of Sesame Street in this episode, and I'm not, I'm not fond of it. Me neither. I'm against it. Yeah. Uh, after that, we had the a really quick scene with a mouse. Um, this scene was so quick, I just wrote down mouse. I don't know what happened in it. I remember that thinking that his voice was similar to Mickey Mouse. It was high and squeaky, which I know could be expected of a mouse, but come on, let, when are we going to see a mouse with like a really deep husky voice? <laughs> you want a tenor the- mouse. Right, like, or a base. Like, just something unexpected. I say, hey, you got Mighty Mouse, I guess. He's... I don't know what Mighty Mouse, what's Mighty Mouse? It's, it's farther away from Mickey Mouse, at least. It's it's Far closer enough. to the other end of the spectrum. But but the vast majority of mice are, are Mickey Mouse-esque. Yeah, so, I don't know. Just yeah. Have some original thoughts, creators. Let's have a different sound. Yeah. Um... Then we went to oh, this is this was the the bizarre scene that you were thinking of uh, the near and far <laughs> scene. What was this? <laughs> I can't decide if I loved this scene or I hated this scene. G- give me your impressions of what what happened here and what its purpose was. Okay, well it was it was just a man. Uh, you were looking at a house, just like a barn or something. Was he dressed like a farmer? It was hard to tell. I was too focused on other things that were happening, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, well, there was a house that, if I'm remembering correctly, looked like a barn, and he was, like, far away, but then he would rapidly be, like, super close to the screen, and it was, like, one of those, um, I don't know if they, like, just paused the camera and had the guy walk forward or something, but he just would, like, flash to different places, and it would say, like, near, far, and uh, then he started doing, like, really weird dances when he would get close, like, he would get down and, like, 
spread his arms out and like separate his legs. It was weird. And it, it went on like that for like a good 30 seconds at least. We need to be clear that by rapidly, you mean by like frame by frame, this guy is yeah. popping in and out near the camera and <laughs> popping it, up and it down. It wasn't like they said near. And then he moved to the next one. No, it was like, boom, 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 boom. He was just flashing back and forth. He didn't go side to side, just back and forth. And it was, it was creepy. It was an assault on the senses. <laughs> it was. It creeped me out. <laughs> did not like it. It was very aggressive, very in your face. And he was he didn't have like a sympathetic face to him. He was very no, intense. It, it was creepy. Yeah. If I was a kid, that would have creeped me out. Yeah. And then the dances on top of it. Right. Um, so, uh, we move on after that to Kermit. He is on the scene in a Sesame Street news flash, which is a weird setup for a thing, but, uh, he's... Really my favorite sketch. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty weird. Um, he's, he's by Sleeping Beauty, who's been asleep for a hundred years, and they are expecting the prince on scene at any moment. Uh, the prince, the part of the prince is played by, uh, the puppet of Guy Smiley. It's never explicitly stated that's who it is, but it's it's his puppet, at least. That was most definitely my favorite scene. I thought that was hilarious. It had a good, very simple, but fun twist to it. Right. So then the prince kisses the princess, and she turns into a frog, which combines Sleeping Beauty and Princess and the Frog, in a way. Yeah. But then Kermit is obviously interested in the princess now that she's a yeah. frog. Kermit which, the frog. Which was hilarious to me. <laughs> they just head off. He's done with his reporting job. Don't he just suspect. Yeah. Don't tell Miss Piggy. Yeah. That was funny. And then we had another short, like ten second thing of Oh wait, no, that was that was in a bit. Uh, then we had the train stop scene. They just shut out it stop and an animation of a train stopped. Oh yeah. Another yeah. unnecessary one. It didn't like go over that it was teaching you what stop means. It just it was weird. Yeah, really like after uh, at some point in the last couple skits, we've lost any sense of a continuing thread, and it's just a mishmash of random scenes with no connecting tissue at all. Yeah. Uh, it just kind of started to become random fillers of time. Yeah. Because uh, that, that stop theme kind of continues into the next thing, where uh, a lumberjack yells timber, and a tree falls. The, the film is immediately played in reverse... <laughs> The tree. And it makes a boing sound <laughs> when it ground. There's a splice of boing sound in there to spice things up. And the lumberjack looks at the camera like he doesn't know what's going on. And then, like the most surreal, like there's this weird droning sound of people saying stop. And... It was that was another creepy thing. Yeah. <laughs> Just this weird, like, hum of people saying stop. And I was like, what is happening here? <laughs> you really wanted it to stop. You did. <laughs> and it was effective it was in that perfect. way. And then the, the lumberjack scene gets flipped on its head in in the next little skit, in which it plays out the same at the beginning. But then instead of seeing a picture of a tree, we see a uh, a match, a matchstick. Mm-hmm. And, on the table, just yeah. with a, a gray background. Not entertaining scene. But but the audio of the tree scene is still playing. So you've got that still in your head and it's playing again, but it's just the the match standing there, and then it's 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 matched up so that the match falls down uh, to the sound of the tree. That was so strange how it had the same audio backing. It was so but bizarre. But it was like it was not related to the, I mean, other than the match falling over, I cannot understand why those two scenes were played in sequence of each other. So many experimental, like, film kind of things going on in this episode. Lots of hit or miss. I kind of like the stop scene just for its weird, like, um, you know, this is what we're doing, <laughs> like it or not. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the the match, weird. Didn't get it. Didn't get what that had to do with a tree in the first <laughs> nope. place. I mean, it, other than it being wood as well, I <laughs> there was no correlation. <laughs> Uh, then we get to uh, Harvey Knee Slapper, which I think is another another attempt to introduce a continuing character that I really, really desperately hope dies off. Not literally dies off, just like goes away. <laughs> but he's a he's an obnoxious, uncharismatic character. Um, Remind he, me of what the skit was. So 
Harvey Kneeslapper explains to the audience that he's going to play a prank on the next guy that walks oh. by. Um, in his hand, he's got a little buzzer that he's going to ask someone to give him a give him a handshake, and then the buzzer's going to go off, and it's going to buzz and surprise the guy. And but the 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 reason that Harvey is so uh, so unbearable is because he's constantly laughing at himself in this scene, and giving away the prank. Right. Uh, he, he he's got his voice. Uh, it, it's a it's a it's a bad combination. I think whoever's doing the voices of the Muppets has used up all their good voices on the previous Muppets because this one is not good. No. Yeah. Um. The the guy walks by and Harvey tries to give him a handshake and he says, "Give me five. But then twist. The guy slaps the number five on Harvey. Which normally when somebody is going to shake your hand, do you say give me five? No, that's that's not a thing that people say. Give me five is for a high five. So when he said when he was explaining the prank and he was like, when he walks up, I'm going to say give me five. I was expecting a high five. Yeah, because that's normally what you say. And then he holds out his hand for a handshake. And I was like, well, that's not the same thing. <laughs> has, has, has the English language changed that much since 1979 that we've we've melded give me five into something different? I, I wouldn't imagine that it would, but it's just, you never know. These weird puppets in this alternate dimension. It's it's related enough. But yeah, Harvey Harvey gets a big thumbs down for me. Yeah, I agree. Uh, then the mouse remember scene. Uh, the mouse can't rem- two mice, two animated mice can't remember where he left his pet or something. It's it's not very. I wasn't very attached to this scene at all. I hardly remember it, if I'm being completely honest, because it made that much of an impression on me. Yeah. I think it makes sense that they have all their most of their weirder scenes towards the end because it's gonna take these hour these episodes are an hour long. And They're so, running out of ideas by yeah. now. But I think more more so is that to keep my attention, you've got to be weirder and weirder. Because this that makes sense. Yeah, this That's... this mouse scene didn't stick with me at all. I think it would have if, if it had been earlier in the episode. But when you're yeah. you're smack in the middle of this timber thing and some of these later later bits, you know, it, there's nothing here. It, his pet's an elephant, I guess. Not funny, not exciting, not memorable. Yeah, nothing. Another to thumbs it. down for me. Yeah. Uh, but then, then we go on to something that I was not fond of was this the scarecrow song, uh, explaining a bunch of joints. <laughs> This, I didn't have as much of a problem with this one as you did. Oh, I did not I like it. I mean, the costumes were creepy and the song was weird, but I kind of found it to be humorous in its weirdness. I guess it had this like vaudevillian sort of weirdness to it, but I think, I think my problem was the song wasn't very good. Like the, it was very slapped together, sort of very forced, bland rhymes. It was a little creepy how they were all dancing around. And then one thing that bothered me is when the third guy started singing, they had the classic dumb guy forgets to come in oh, for yeah. his part of the song. And I was just like, oh, come on. Why does that always have to be part of it? <laughs> why can't they just execute? Yeah, why does there always got to be a kid that can't remember to sing? Yeah. And he's usually the the dumb one. And it's it's <laughs> only. So, yeah, that song's about teaching you that you know, give all of the parts of your body equal respect. Don't don't focus on eyes, ears, and heart, and that sort of thing. You know, remember remember the elbow, remember the knee, remember the ankle, the shoulder, etc. Um, right. I don't know. I don't know why they had to be scarecrows. I guess like they're kind of like floppy and dancey. I guess. Is that a, yeah, is, is that a stereotype that... that started with Wizard of Oz? I don't know, but I thought their their choice of scarecrows to explain joints was really weird, considering they don't have any. <laughs> Aren't they just filled with, like, hey, I, I don't get why they chose scarecrows to explain joints. You make a good point that scarecrows are not living creatures. They do not have our physiology. Yeah, they don't have really any physiology. They're not, <laughs> they're not things. <laughs> Next scene. <laughs> Fives in space. Fives in space. <laughs> this is another one that just what what who came up with the design for this? This is a weird scene too. <laughs> uh, this is a good way to end. Well, not to end. It's all we're almost done. I think this this is where they should have ended, in my opinion, because the next couple 
aren't very good. Because... But you you had forgotten about the number five being the theme until this came around, so at least it's it like hmm. reminded you. Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like just the number five goes through this sort of great like divider thing that's floating in space, and then out pops on the other side five random objects. A giraffe, and then a fire hydrant, and what was the last? One? I think it was a pumpkin. Oh right. Yeah. And then out of nowhere. The letter M yeah. tries to... What was it... Go, what were they going through? It was this weird, like, sort of... I took it as, as some sort of, like, like like a cheese grater might grate cheese. Like, I feel like the five was kind of going through this, like, splitter thing. That's what it looked I, like to me. I could not figure out what it was supposed to be going through. But the M obviously was not well received by whatever object the fives were floating through. Numbers because only. Because the M just shattered. <laughs> Yeah, it did not make it through, and that's where the scene ends. So no, no explanation. I kind of liked it. I thought it was like there was there was a way that they ended an episode a while back where it was just uh, like space music and like they were it was just video of a bowl of fruit, and I like the the sort of like the last scene of an episode should be this weird like space like void thing. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going. Just something that leaves you thinking. Yeah, something to, to think on until the next <laughs> the next episode. Uh, after that, we got some stock footage of prairie dogs. <laughs> okay, that was similar to the turtles in my brain because nothing happened. It was just what were they even doing? They weren't even doing anything. They're very mundane animals, turtles and prairie dogs alike. They just they just. I don't like move around in dirt sometimes. And it and it was just a kid going prairie dog and it didn't do anything. Yeah. More exciting to watch than the turtle, I will say. Sure, there was just you know, in a very basic sense, there were there was more action. He had more velocity. <laughs> I I'm hesitant to use that word, but I will agree. Yeah. Um uh coming up on the end we had a quick uh animation of an N. A living typewriter types an N on himself and is joined by a giant nose. Which then sneezes on him. Yeah, and just sneezes him away. I, I don't have much to say about that. It, it, I didn't love it. Yeah. I didn't dislike it. You shouldn't have any strong opinions because to give this, this skit any more thought would be to put more effort into it than the creator did. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, not... Not the the best. Yeah. Please please forget about this scene, is what it was telling me. And I will be it, happy to so, oblige. It, it also, the only purpose I felt it served was to demonstrate that nose starts with N. But they didn't even say that outright. So I don't know how many kids would actually come up with that on their own. Sure. I, I like to think about the sketches and what they're going to do for the, the kids watching. Hmm. That's a good point. I felt like a lot of this episode didn't have a purpose to it, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not what Sesame Street's for. Yeah, I think this this episode was heavy on this sort of uh, just aesthetic pleasure as opposed to giving purpose to some of their scenes, more so than any of the episodes previous. That could be why I was, like, against some of the scenes so heavily. Yeah. Thinking too much on what it would do for a child when that may not have been the purpose. Mm. Well, you know, there's a lot of ways to take in Sesame Street. Um, the, but to close up this episode, we are joined by Big Bird once again. He opens it up, he closes it up, just like a good bird does. Um, he, he's, he's, at the bottom, he's at the bottom of some steps, and he says, Do you want to see something amazing and fantastic? And, Which it was. Right. Absolutely amazing. He counts the steps as he climbs them. There are six steps on Sesame Street. Mark it down in the history books. Six steps. That was important to remember, too. <laughs> uh, he moves up and down, and we fade out to the delightful credits music. So what'd you think on the whole, Emily? Well, wait, going back to that last sketch, wasn't oh, okay. wasn't he demonstrating that um, he was trying to make it sound like... I I thought that he was trying to make it sound like there were different steps going up and down, because... Uh, he went back up first, right? Yes, he started at the bottom. Now we're here. Okay, and then he counted to six, 
and he went one, two, three, four, five, six. But when he went back down, he said five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> so was he trying to suggest there was a different amount of steps you had to take to go up and down? I think this is an exploration of the theory of relativity. <laughs> if you're at the bottom, there's there's less than at the top. Big Bird was going all scientific on us there. Yeah. All right, so we've we've managed a thorough, detailed, descriptive overview of this episode. Um, Emily, final thoughts? You know, uh, after I just had the revelation of not thinking about a kid's a kid's like learning show, mm -hmm. some of the weirder sketches I will pardon and not dislike so much. But I liked it. I was entertained. I really, really liked the Kermit with the frog one. I thought that was really funny. Yeah. I don't know, good good episode. I would have been entertained as a child and was still today. Yeah. So I was entertained now. Yeah. <laughs> Which it achieved its purpose then. I, I would not have expected to say on episode seven of my watch every episode of Sesame Street podcast. But here we are, still enjoying it. But can I can I ask what made you come up with that? This uh, goal? Well, it, it's it's a few things. Um the number one is that I have a sort of obsession with chronicling everything of something. Like whenever I, I watch any TV show, I need to start at the beginning. Uh -huh. Um, you know, whenever I like read a book, I need to like if I've if I've taken a break from a book series, I need to start at the beginning and then make my way all the way through. Okay. Um, so that's kind of so that's kind of my and I really enjoy like when things are collected all in one place. Like for a while, like every episode of Roseanne was uploaded to one YouTube channel. And that, I don't know what it is, but that stuff, it just really, I love it. Like, I love when things are archived in a very orderly, in one place fashion. Okay, so what made you decide that Sesame Street was what you wanted to chronicle? Um, it was really kind of on a whim. Uh, someone asked me why I don't have a podcast yet. And I said, that's a good point. And I said to myself, well, what's it going to be? And I knew it had to be watching everything of something and chronicling it. And I said, what is there a lot of? Sesame Street, done. It, was <laughs> it a, just came to you like that? It was a five-second like... process of, of I need a podcast, what's it going to be? Done. Did, did your thought process waver when you figured out there was over 4,000 episodes? Oh, no, that just made me become more committed. See, that would turn me away. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the breaking point right there. Plus, now, now there's, there's, a, there's a sort of meta story in which there seems to be like the vast majority of episodes are not publicly available which uh is going to make for a very fun time for me where i hope that this becomes a big enough thing to where i can use my influence on pbs to say hey give me access to the secret vault <laughs> you're like a respected member member around the sesame street headquarters right i i've got all, i've got all the connections that's, that makes sense. So that's where I see this going in about a thousand episodes. You know, dream big. That's what I say. Fake it till you right. make it. Go for it. <laughs> uh, so, so thanks a ton for joining me, Emily. It's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hope to do it again sometime. Yeah. We'll definitely be hearing from you very soon in the future. Uh, but for now, this has been Neighborhood Watch, the Sesame Street Marathon Podcast Odyssey. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next time.